Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Spencer and I'm AEN Senior Associate for Membership. We'd like to thank Dr. Slavik Halper, who in addition to all of her amazing work as a professor at the University of Georgia, also chairs AEN section for faculty in STEM. We're very grateful for the work that she did organizing today's event with Professor Greenbaum. And now I'll pass it over to Dr. Halper to introduce Professor Steve Greenbaum, who will be leading today's talk. Well, thank you for the excellent introduction. Didn't expect all these accolades, but anyway, we are very lucky to have Dr. Steve Greenbaum today as our first speaker, I hope will be a whole series. And he currently he's a distinguished professor of physics at Hunter College and CUNY. And when I'm, he's distinguished not just in title, but also in substance. He received a PhD from Brown University. And then he did several postdocs or research at the semiconductor branch of the US Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, also Fulbright Scholar at Weizmann Institute, and also worked as a NASA Senior Research Fellow at the Jet Propulsion Lab Caltech. And he is a member of the team which designed actually the lithium ion batteries for the successful Mars rover mission. I think that I'm really impressed with that and I'm sure we'll get a wonderful lecture. He also was visiting professors or professor all over the world. And I just want to mention he was at the School of Chemistry at Tel Aviv University. He also was uh, one of 11 Jefferson Science Fellows who served as a senior science and technology advisor to the US Secretary of State in 2014 or 2015 years. And I hope we learned something from him about uh, lithium batteries and electric cars. So please, Steve, it's all yours. Thank you, Slavka, for that very generous uh, introduction. Uh, let's see. Can you see the screen? Yes, I can. Great. Thank you. Let me uh, just push this up. Okay. Um, so uh, <clears throat> I know that not everybody here, I, I recognize at least a couple of people that know about batteries, uh, but I'm going to try to keep this uh, kind of ground level for those that don't. Uh, so I'm going to start with the um, motivating the talk, uh, you know, why we need advances in energy storage technologies. And I'm going to give you mo background mostly on lithium, ba lithium based batteries, uh, the good and the bad. And uh, most of the talk will, will be devoted to uh, uh, current uh, efforts in Israel, and especially uh, jointly with uh, investigators at the US uh, side of things. So uh, here's some quotes from some notable people from Bill Gates, all the batteries on earth can store only 10 minutes of the world's electricity. We need a big breakthrough. Uh, John Doerr is the, uh, was the principal of one of the largest venture capital firms in the country in Silicon Valley. A uh, single most disruptive thing that could be done. Game changer would be to improve batteries. And MIT Tech Review, better battery could change everything. Very concise, but also very true. Um, so let me just set the stage here from a slide from a course I think that Nate Lewis at Caltech gave uh, over 25 years ago. Um, if we really, really had to, could we get all of our electricity from the sun? Okay, that's, that's the question that sets this thing up. So here's the exercise. It's basically arithmetic. Uh, we know the land area of the U.S. Uh, it's a pretty big country. Uh, we also know the average sunlight over day and night and over the seasons and over the geography. It's about 200 watts per square meter. And the in the year 2000, our primary energy consumption was about 3.3 uh, terawatt hours, right? Or uh, I guess a terawatt year, rather, uh, which is this terrible unit called a quad, a quad quadrillion BTUs, about 100 of those. It's a little more than that now, but not much more. So if we do the arithmetic and we um, and we also make the very conservative assumption that only 10% of the sunlight gets converted to electricity, and that's easily done, right? That's a very modest assumption. It turns out that we, we could actually do this in only about 1.7% of the land area of the US, okay? So what does the three terawatt square look like? That's it. I, of course, I put it strategically in the Southwest where you have a lot of sunshine and of course, the realistically it would be distributed over the country, okay? But this is just really a, a, to show that it could be done if it really had to be done, 
okay? Um, if you have a more worldwide view, uh, then this is what our three terawatt squares look like. This is an outdated slide, obviously, because China gets another one now. Um, and uh, th again, this is just to show that it could be done. Uh, well, the sun doesn't shine at night. We know that. Uh, and uh, if you want to go to um, <clears throat> wind energy, for example, as a supplement, uh, the wind doesn't blow all the time. It doesn't blow with the same intensity. So if you look at the output of a typical wind generator, you get this uh, these very irregular line. You know, you don't want to pull. You don't want this coming out of your wall to to power your devices. So you need a, a medium to store this vast amounts of electricity. Uh, this is an experimental vanadium redox battery facility as shown under the wind generators in Japan. Um, and so the bottom line is for renewable, in order to enable renewable energy at a meaningful scale, we need massive storage capability, which we don't currently have, not at this scale. Uh, if you're looking at electric cars, which of course are a reality now, uh, this is a slide from uh, my colleague, Randy Lysing, a, a company I used to consult with, or I still do actually, Ionic Materials. If you look at the new car sales per year, um, and this is worldwide, okay, it's about 88 million. And if you look at, you figure about an average pack size, battery pack size of 50 kilowatt hours, that means you need about 1300 of these 10 amp hour cells per vehicle. So that translates to 114 billion cells, right? And if you if you go worldwide, uh, and I mean, rather if you, if you, if all the vehicles in the world became electric overnight, which of course is ridiculous, but it's for the pr purpose of this exercise, still useful. Uh, you have uh, 1.5 trillion <laughs> total cells needed. And if you look at the cost of this, if you, let's say $100 per kilowatt hour, which we could probably do a little bit better than that, but that, that's a, usually given as a figure of merit. The batteries to, to make all the cars in the world electric would cost about $6 trillion. Now, that's a huge number, right? The numbers like trillion don't phase us anymore because we hear about this all the time in the popular media. Uh, but that's a lot of money. It's bigger than the GDP of every country besides the US and China. So electric vehicle battery development is certainly a, a worthwhile goal. Okay, so uh, we know that lithium ion technology has really changed our lives, certainly from the point of view of personal electronics like laptops and cell phones and so forth, power tools, uh, electric bikes, and even electric cars now. Uh, because the advantages are obvious uh, in terms of the so-called gravimetric energy density. You, got, you can store more energy per kilogram of mass uh, and the volumetric energy, a smaller footprint for, for a, given, uh, uh, a given volume, you can store more, much more energy in lithium ion compared to let's say the nearest competitor in this picture would be nickel metal hydride, which by the way was the, uh, the first generation of uh, hybrid vehicles by Toyota Prius. Uh, that was the nickel metal hydride battery. So, uh, well, we got problems though. This is a very old picture um, of uh, uh, laptops being charged during a conference. Uh, and this is not a gasoline fire, but it's a battery fire. Okay, so uh, uh, we worry about these issues. So why stop at uh, cars? Uh, the, you, you may recall in 2013, the entire uh, fleet of Boeing 787 Dreamliners was uh, grounded for about six months because the, uh, there were two events. Uh, fortunately, none of them, and no injuries involved. Both, both occurred when the planes were on the ground. Um, uh, the lithium ion battery in the uh, auxiliary power unit caught fire, it started smoking. So that, that delayed the uh, rollout of these planes for, for six months or more. Uh, so the culprit is uh, this organic solvent. Uh, here's a schematic of a lithium ion battery. Uh, the reason it's called lithium ion is because there's no metallic lithium. Lithium ions just merely slide back and forth between the electrodes and the, uh, re these reactions are called intercalation. The ions slip in between the planes of, of atoms. And on the left side, you have the graphite planes. On the right side, you have a transition metal oxide and lithium ions move back and forth. And their motion is made possible by this liquid electrolyte. And liquid electrolyte is based on an organic solvent, which has roughly the energy density of kerosene. Okay, so if you have a thermal event, like a short circuit, the uh, organic solvent provides the fuel the fire. All right, um, if you're familiar with New York City Transit, maybe you've seen the signs, um, no hoverboards allowed because they have lithium, uh, uh, lithium ion batteries. Uh, you may remember the Samsung Galaxy Note 7 that was banned. Uh, you couldn't even go to the airport if you were approaching the, 
if you got on the ex exit ramp from uh, to go to the airport, you, the, they had signs, no Galaxy Note 7s allowed, okay? Uh, uh, Samsung tried to cut some corners. They tried to squeeze a little more energy in the little package, and, uh, and th that was the result. So um, in terms of how we mitigate this, uh, in the center panel, we have this conventional lithium ion battery. You have a graphite electrode on the left. You've got some separator in the middle and you have uh, transition metal oxide on the right. Um, and uh, the separator has liquid in it. Now you could, if you, you could go to the, uh, uh, all the way to the right and you can make a solid. If you could somehow replace the liquid electrolyte with a solid that conducts ions reasonably well, um, then that will give you improved safety but not necessarily improved energy density. If you go all the way to the left, if you eliminate the graphite and you make a lithium metal battery, you know, in other words, the graphite is just a container to, to hold a very reactive lithium. But if you could get, get rid of the graphite, you can increase the energy density and lower the cost. That's easily more easily said than done, but this is certainly a direction that many people in the world are taking. Um, so uh, one of the challenges though, this is also this is also a very big challenge for, for liquid electrolytes. You see that um, on the left, uh, um, the, and you go a little bit to the right, uh, you've this thing called dendrites. What happens is that when you charge and discharge a battery, when you, when you redeposit the lithium, it doesn't form a nice flat plane, uh, but actually you get these little spiky structures called dendrites. In a liquid cell, they grow very rapidly and they can reach across the entire cell, short circuit the cell, and there you, and there you have your, your event, your thermal event, okay? Uh, but even in a solid, uh, it turns out that the dendrites can grow around these, these grains of uh, solid, solid particles. So, so these, are, these are major challenges that people are, are, are trying to address uh, these days in order to, to, get, to get to higher energy density batteries based on lithium metal rather than, than on graphite. So uh, let me just highlight two very important programs uh, for cooperation between Israel and the U.S. Uh, the one on the left is, is called the Binational Industrial Research and Development Foundation, or BIRD Foundation. Um, and the, even the U.S. Department of Energy has gotten involved in funding various clean energy technology projects between the Israel and the U.S. On the right is the Binational uh, United States-Israel Science Foundation. This is the program I've been involved with for over a dozen years. Um, and this facilitates uh, research arrangements between universities in the U.S. Uh, and, and in Israel. The Bird Foundation is mostly for companies. Okay, the BSF is mostly for universities. Um, and in, in recent years, uh, the solicitation for BSF grants uh, comes um, uh, through the National Science Foundation because the NSF is actually co-hosting some of these programs. So I'd like to highlight the rest of my talk. I'd like to highlight the work of four individuals who I actually know personally quite well, and, and uh, some of them I've worked with for a quarter of a century. Uh, it's Professor Manuel Pellet and Dina Goldnitsky from Tel Aviv University, and Professor Malachi Nokit and uh, uh, Doron Arbach from Bar Ilan University. So uh, Emmanuel Pellet, I'm gonna talk about his work first. Um, you may remember that the 2019 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was given uh, for uh, lithium, uh, the lithium ion battery development. Uh, by Stan Whittingham, uh, Whittingham, Yoshino, and Goodenough, right? But uh, one could argue that Emmanuel Pellet's contribution to this technology is as important in the same category, okay? He came up with the concept of the solid electrolyte interface, SEI. You cannot read a paper on lithium ion batteries without seeing the term SEI, and Professor Pellet is the one who developed the concept. Basically, what happens when you can when you first even uh, assemble a battery, the liquid electrolyte, which is an organic solvent with lithium in it, um, basically partially decomposes and forms a layer on top of the electrode. Okay, whether it's lithium or carbon, and it's this interfacial layer that actually prohibit that could, that allows the ions to pass through, but keeps the electrons from going out. Okay, so uh, this is a necessary step and a necessary. Um, entity uh, in a working lithium ion battery. And it was, this concept was first elucidated by Emmanuel Pellet in, uh, in, way back in 1979. Uh, and he's also made equally important contributions to lithium sulfur technology and even uh, direct methanol fuel cells. I'll, I'll go over that in just, just a few minutes. So for lithium sulfur, uh, this sounds like a great idea if you could only make it work. Um, 
If you could replace the uh, transition metal uh, electrode with sulfur, uh, you can get four to five times the energy storage capacity of current state of the art. Okay, this is just a concept. Um, actually, uh, another nice thing about sulfur is that it's plentiful. <laughs> we don't know what to do with it. It's, 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 uh, it's all over the place. It's a byproduct of the petroleum industry and other mining activities. So just for historical sake, uh, Professor Pellet's group was the first to publish a viable lithium sulfur battery. Okay, back in 1989, this is this work on, on uh, the, the picture of the lithium sulfur cell, and um, and the the, um, the reference here citation uh, is a you know one of the most highly cited <laughs> citations in in uh, lithium sulfur batteries. And on the on the left is um, just some performance characteristics. They they actually put in something called a barrier layer which uh, when you have reactions between lithium and sulfur, you have some undesirable products that can, that can diffuse back to the lithium electrode and basically kill the cell. But this barrier layer actually prevent, uh, inhibited that. And you see that these, uh, these blue, uh, the curves above the red showed that you could get um, increased cycle life and increased capacity. Uh, um, typically, um, uh, uh, this is almost of commercial quality, of commercial interest. Um, now, for grid storage, uh, this, is, this is a slide also from Professor Pellet. Um, uh, one of the best ways to store electricity uh, is uh, by pumped, pumped hydro, essentially hydroelectric storage. Uh, but you need certain geog geography for that. You need, you need uh, a place to put your reservoir. So in Israel, for example, it's only about 10% of the needs for storage that you have. Uh, um, a couple of uh, reservoirs here are listed. Uh, um, the Gilboa and the Kohav Chayarden. Uh, and um, basically uh, uh, one produces 300 megawatts, uh, one can store 300 megawatts, uh, rather produce 300 megawatts for, for several hours, and the other one about half that uh, for several hours. Um, so let me just move this out of the way. Um, so in the current time frame. Uh, there are several commercial companies that are installing uh, 3.5 gigawatt hours uh, uh, with a four, four hour uh, capability for using lithium ion. Um, and that what that means essentially is one full size power plant that can run for four hours, essentially full size, meaning about a, gig, a, a typical large uh, a facility like, like a nuclear or fossil fuel power plant will produce about one gigawatt electric, right? So this is about one full-size power plant for four hours. It's estimated, estimated by 2030 that Israel need, will need about 300,000 tons of lithium-ion batteries or 50 gigawatt hours. In my humble opinion, let's see, this is not working. Let's see, I'm trying to get this. Uh, yeah, here we go. Okay, in my, per, in my humble opinion, I don't think lithium-ion is the way to go. Uh, lithium is expensive, uh, and, and it's, it's becoming uh, harder and harder to get and more expensive. Uh, if we can go to another chemistry like sodium, uh, then I think that would be the way to go because uh, uh, you don't really care about the footprint, right? The, for, for stationary grid storage, uh, you don't care about the volume uh, as you do for, for, let's say, an electric car. Okay, so I think sodium would be the way to go. And there is some development activity in sodium that I'm going to highlight in a few minutes. So. Um, here's what you get when you get rid of the graphite, right? So the, this is, of course, exaggerated in size, but if you could, if you could somehow get rid of the graphite, and on the bottom curve, uh, you see that there's the copper current collector on the left, and the lit in, in this situation, in the so-called discharge state, when you charge the battery, you would literally be pulling lithium out of the cathode material and, and depositing it on the current collector. And then this is reversible, goes back and forth, so you save a lot in volume and you, you increase the energy density, you reduce the cost by 20% uh, and you have like 40 to 50% gain in both volumetric and gravimetric uh, energy density. So this is, this is, a, this is a method that, that people are, are really aiming for. This, this is a strategy that people are aiming for. Um, and Professor Pellet's group, uh, they found that if you modify the liquid electrolyte by putting in nanoparticles, right? Um, uh, then you could you could actually uh, get substantial improvements. So uh, again, this is not prim this is primarily not a battery audience. Uh, so I'll just just take a moment to explain this. Um, uh, the so-called coulombic efficiency uh, tells you like how many cycles you could run, and you really want to be very close to 100%, like 99.99. 
right? Um, and the um, the capacity retention, the the, uh, the axis on the left, just tells you how much how much capacity you have after a certain number of cycles. And you see that uh, the addition of nanoparticles in a very small amount, like one percent by weight, uh, various like aluminum oxide or titanium oxide or silicon oxide, uh, gives you substantial uh, capacitive retention Im improvements. Now, this is nowhere near uh, commercial viability yet, but it shows that this is certainly a promising avenue to to pursue. Um, so, the summary is that of this is that uh, you can increase the Coulombic efficiency. Uh, again, you need something like 99.99 for commercial viability. Um, you increase the cycle life by a factor of four. Um, you slow the, the drying of the electrolyte, the evaporation. Uh, and the, actually, they ran for about 2,000 cycles with no, not even a single sign of dendrite formation, which these things lead to, to uh, shorts. So very promising results. Uh, uh, last, thing, last slide on this topic uh, with Professor Pellet is... Um, uh, I could give a whole talk on fuel cells, which of course I, I'm not going to do, but a fuel cell is sort of like a battery. Okay, in a battery, all the chemical reactants are stored in a sealed container. In a fuel cell, the reactants are stored in tanks uh, external to, to the device. And uh, by the, the chemical reaction between hydrogen and bromine, you produce hydrogen bromide, but you could do that electrochemi electrochemically. In other words, when you combine the two, you get electricity out. When you separate the two, you, it requires electricity. So this is a way to store um, electricity uh, using this device called a fuel cell. Professor Pellets, one of Professor Pellets companies that he started is called N Storage, and they actually made 12 kilowatt stacks of these uh, hydrogen bromide regenerative fuel cells. And uh, it's been commercialized with a company called Areva uh, to 120 kilowatt system. Okay, so uh, these, these things could be good for uh, peak demand management or for microgrids. All right, so let me move on to my other colleague, Professor Dina Golubnitsky, um, who is a pioneer in 3D battery printing technology. Okay, um, a lot of people making three-dimensional batteries, and I think uh, the Tel Aviv group is, is uh, at, the, at the head of the list. So uh, the market for flexible electronics is uh, growing. You know, it could be approaching a billion dollars in, in less than a decade. Um, and uh, just some ideas, uh, concept ideas on the right for uh, what you would use a flexible electronics. By the way, the army is also interested in these for, for a soldier apparel, okay? Um, so the traditional way of making batteries, whether it's uh, cylindrical, prismatic, or pouch, um, these, the, uh, the one on the top left, that's also sometimes called a jelly roll uh, for obvious reasons. The traditional way of making them is quite complicated, okay? You, uh, you start with a slurry, you put in these organic solvents and you have all these steps in between uh, all the way to the end. Um, and if you do that, um, it turns out that um, they're all time consuming, expensive. Now, of course, batteries companies to invest a lot of money in developing these things. Uh, they have specialized machinery and the, uh, the solvents the, and the precursors are, are toxic and, and not so great for the environment and they're a disposable problem. There are disposable problems associated with them as well. See, I'm having trouble advancing my slide. Here we go. Okay, so um, uh, uh, Professor Goldnitsky has pioneered uh, the so-called fused filament fabrication method with uh, direct ink writing and aerosol jet printing. And uh, the great advantage of this is that you can integrate these directly with uh, the, uh, your electronics, essentially. Uh, there's uh, no solvent and it's environmentally friendly. So here's a, here's a concept of a so-called multi-coaxial cable battery, where you have the electrodes on the out, the, you have the positive electrode on the outside, and in the very in, inside you have the, um, uh, in this coaxial configuration, you have the negative electrode. And in between, you have the, uh, the various, um, um, uh, the, the, the electrolyte, essentially. Okay, so uh, it turns out that you can extrude these things out. If you can make these things like spaghetti, you can imagine the flexibility you have in, in what form factor you want to make. Okay, so uh, it turns out one of the, one of the uh, um, uh, <clears throat> I guess, innovations of this technology was to find an actual electrolyte in the middle that can conduct the ions and be compatible mechanically with, uh, with this uh, coaxial configuration. So the beauty of this is here shown here is you can actually make all, you make the entire cable in one shot. 
the uh, co-extrusion of the multi-coaxial multi cable battery. Uh, the concept is shown on the right. Uh, you have all the input channels and, and what comes out is a coaxial battery. And if you put these, print these things out like spaghetti, then of course, uh, again, that gives you a huge amount of flexibility in, in, in uh, making a battery any size or shape that you want and to fit almost any need. Um, our contribution uh, is, uh, here's the electrolyte, uh, this so-called, it's a mixture of uh, polylactic acid, PLA, and polyethylene oxide, PEO, with a lithium salt. Uh, we also put in some nanoparticles of aluminum oxide. Um, and uh, it, it took a while to actually make a uniform, uh, homogeneous uh, layer of the stuff that could be used in the coaxial battery. And just to show you, these are the publications from our BSF, by National Science Foundation grant with Tel Aviv. Uh, number eight uh, is actually one we actually contributed to by characterizing the ion transport processes inside the uh, electrolyte. Uh, this is the this is mostly the work the work that we did at Hunter College was mostly the work of my graduate my former graduate student Nishani Jayakoti. All right, so let me move on to uh, Professor Auerbach, who's uh, quite a what you would call a, I suppose a superstar in the <laughs> internationally known and in batteries. Um, he is actually, I believe, the first non-US based editor-in-chief of the Journal of Electrochemical Society. Huge amount of publications, huge H index, uh, uh, too many international and national awards to list, 55 students, uh, P, uh, PhD students supervised, many of whom are now uh, stars, superstars in their own right, and you know, uh, captains of industry or, or uh, distinguished professors themselves. And of course, he's got extensive ties to industry in, in not just Israel, but the, also the US and Europe. So on the right is just kind of a concept of where these things fit together. Um, uh, making, making better batteries is, is a little more complicated than you might think at first. Um, you've got uh, various interfacial engineering issues, like when you make an elect electrodes and electrolyte, how do you know if they're gonna work together when you put them together, right? So. Um, and then there's, there's a huge effort in synthesis of new materials. Uh, there's a lot of modeling. There's a lot of machine learning and informatics and artificial intelligence that goes into, you can't, you can't try everything. You, you, you can't use an Edisonian approach for everything. There's, just too, there's too huge a volume. So there's a lot of machine learning going on. And there's a lot of uh, cooperation and commercial, uh, the commercialization efforts uh, and so forth. On the left uh, panel is, um, just a list, a partial list of the US entities and the Israeli entities uh, listed. Okay, so you have, for example, SAFT is a, actually, SAFT is a, a very large battery company. They're based in France, but they have a big US affiliate, uh, SAFT USA. Um, they make mostly military type of batteries. Uh, uh, Iron Power is involved, and uh, Forge Nano is a, a small company in the US. And, uh, and then you have the uh, Israeli side below. Um, so, Again, this is not primarily a battery audience, so let me just say the following. There are two huge efforts coming out of Bar Ilan uh, in uh, uh, Pro Professor Auerbach's, uh, um, uh, under his purview. Uh, one is on cobalt-free lithium ca cathodes. Uh, this is a big deal because um, you may remember that, uh, well, you may know, some of you may know that the original lithium ion battery was based on a, a material called lithium cobalt oxide which was uh, invented by uh, Professor Goodenough in Texas. Uh, the, he's, again, he's one of the Nobel laureates for, for lithium ion batteries. But cobalt is what you would call a conflict element, right? It comes from, the, from a very large source of cobalt is, is the Congo, uh, which has uh, been over the years accused of uh, serious child labor violations, of uh, child labor law violations. Uh, so we want to and, and we want to get rid of the cobalt. So we want to replace it with another transition metal. It's hard, it's, it's challenging to do that, but uh, there's been a lot of progress on on doing so. Um, uh, manganese and nickel, for example, and iron. Uh, nickel is another thing. Uh, it's not a conflict material, but it's but it's it's expensive. So uh, some key uh, uh, strategies are to replace the cobalt and also to, uh, to replace the nickel. Uh, so there's a lot of work being done on that. And also I mentioned. I mentioned sodium. Uh, uh, sodium is just one, one, one position down the periodic table from lithium. So the chemistry is quite similar, right? Um, but sodium is usually abundant compared to lithium, right? Just think of seawater, right? 
Um, and uh, if you could make the sodium chemistry work as well, or nearly as well, as, and especially for stationary storage, like uh, for grids, you don't really care about the size of the battery as you do for, let's say, an electric car. Um, so there's been a lot of work um, on developing uh, sodium-based batteries as well, a lot of it coming from, uh, from uh, Professor Auerbach's uh, laboratory. Uh, so um, here's another uh, thing I want to highlight. Uh, that, um, uh, I mentioned the uh, flammability of the electrolytes. Well, it turns out that if you could, if you can use uh, fluorinated analogs, if you uh, make these uh, uh, carbonates with fluorine in them, uh, you can uh, improve the safety and you can improve other properties as well. So there's a huge effort worldwide on fluorinated electrolytes, and a lot of that uh, leading that effort, I think. Uh, I could honestly say is, is the work that uh, Professor Arbach is doing. And note that this is the, the slide over here. This is a collaboration between uh, Bar-Ilan University and the main research development lab of, of GM in Warren, Michigan. Okay, so, so uh, um, you, you may have, uh, the president of, of, of GM famously re recently announced that by 2035, GM is gonna stop manufacturing internal combustion engine cars. Okay, so GM is all in with both feet in electric cars, and they're working with uh, Professor Pellet's group uh, on, on this so-called fluorinated electrolyte technology. Um, now, one group can't do all, so uh, to develop these electrolytes, uh, prof uh, Professor, I'm sorry, Professor Auerbach has teamed up with a, a company in the U.S. called Cura, and their big thing is uh, floral products. Okay, they know how to make the stuff, and the idea is that um, uh, they, they, they make these trial compounds and then they're, they are tried in batteries, uh, um, in, in cells, experimental cells, and uh, you correlate the chemical structures of, the, of these compounds with the battery performance characteristics, characteristics in order to figure out which ones work the best. Um, and uh, uh, ultimately, this hopefully will lead to developing a novel electrolytes that are uh, safer and, and, and have better performance. Uh, and uh, uh, it should be noted that um, these things are fairly expensive now. So uh, once we have something that works, then the next step is to figure out a way to scale it up uh, so that they're affordable. Okay, so that again, all of these things are, are on the table, are under consideration in this kind of uh, joint work. Um, just to show you that uh, <clears throat> it's more than just batteries. If you, uh, Professor Auerbach is, uh, um, a well-known electrochemist, and in addition to electrochemical energy storage, there's a lot more you could do with electrochemistry. So, for example, here's a pro project with, between Barilon and Yale, um, and uh, in which which you can electrochemically remove boron from seawater. Okay, uh, you may know that uh, Israel is no is no stranger to um, mineral recovery. Remember the Dead Sea Works? Maybe you've heard of the Dead Sea Works in Israel. Uh, so they pioneered a lot of uh, a lot of these technologies. Water desalination is also an electrochemical uh, method that's that's uh, being highly pursued in in in, in uh, Professor Auerbach's group. Um, so finally, um, uh, we have a Professor Maliki Noked, who's a, a younger colleague of, of Professor Pellet. Uh, you know, certainly a rising superstar, um, and uh, uh, he's he's certainly found his way into the U.S.-Israel uh, uh, network. Um, uh, so, uh, one of the things uh, that I want to show is a very recent uh, collaboration between uh, Bar Ilan and University of Maryland. University of Maryland has a very very large battery research effort. There's something like a half dozen distinguished professors, uh, and they've each started a couple of companies. Um, and they're also in proximity to the U.S. Army Research Laboratory. Um, so uh, this is a, a, a collaboration between uh, uh, Professor Nokid and uh, uh, Professor Paul Albertus in Maryland. Paul, Paul was actually a program manager at the Department of Energy before becoming a faculty member. So he's pretty well plugged into uh, the U.S. DOE's uh, interests in, in battery development. So uh, the, the uh, first few, this is something we all had to endure, right? <laughs> all these meetings in Zoom, all right? So the first, the first meeting of, uh, of the consortium was held virtually. Uh, and uh, on the top, I've listed the participants, uh, Bar-Ilan, the Clark School of Engineering is for University of Maryland. There's also Forge Nano and Saft, which are the two companies in, in the US and Material Zone uh, in, in Israel. Um, so they had actually had their, um, First in-person meeting in June uh, at uh, 
University of Maryland. You, of course, uh, the College Park, Maryland is a very short drive from uh, Washington, DC. You can see the Washington Monument uh, in the background of some of these photos. Uh, so what, what this final effort that I'm talking about today, uh, there, there are essentially five tests that were identified and that are underway. And the first is to increase uh, the performance. Uh, when you put an electrolyte, uh, electrolyte material, new one, and a new cathode together, you don't know if they're going to work when you stick them together. So, so they, um, uh, there's a development of that. And uh, you know, one of the things that you want to do is to try to lower the interfacial resistance on, on the cathode particles and on the lithium metal on, the, on either side of the electrolyte. Uh, the other, th the other uh, task, the second task, is to, to make these new solid electrolytes and you want to eliminate the flammable liquid electrolytes. Uh, and you also want to eliminate the cobalt, as, I, as I, I talked about the motivation for that just a little while, a little while ago. Um, so uh, the goal is to make uh, essentially a cathode with about 230 milliamp hours per gram. And that's not as high as you can get, but it's pretty close. And uh, it, it would be great if you could make that with a solid electrolyte. Okay, that's uh, certainly a, a worthy goal, and I think it's an achievable goal within the time frame of, uh, of this uh, of this project. Uh, task three is uh, modeling informatics and electric chemical analysis. Uh, this is again looking at lithium metal um, as opposed to graphite. Uh, when you when you cycle the metal when you cycle the battery, uh, how do, how well does the lithium plate? On the on the uh, electrode, and that that's uh, uh, that, that's a, a, certainly a key issue. Uh, materials discovery again, there's only so many experiments you could do in a, with a certain number of people in a certain amount of time. So they've been making very profitable use of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence to accelerate the discovery. Um, and then uh, the second year, uh, once you've studied the plating, you want to see how stable it is. You want to look at things like fracture and 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 so forth. Uh, the fourth, uh, uh, the fourth task is uh, no less than the development of a full cell. You know, typically uh, you might be spending a lot of time on one electrode or on the other electrode or an electrolyte, but then you put them all together to make a full cell. Um, uh, there's a whole, usually unanticipated set of things that come up, um, and then you want to make you want to maximize the energy storage, both uh, gravimetrically how much energy you can store per mass or volumetrically how much energy you can, you can store per volume. And you obviously you wanna make them in such a way that they exceed the current state of the art lithium ion. Okay, so if you do that in the first year, second year you, you optimize things and try to get uh, even better results. And finally, um, uh, the fifth task is commercialization. Okay, partnering with companies, all right? And, and disseminating research and, and so forth. Okay, so uh, it's an ambitious program. But uh, you've got uh, for, for, formidable teams on both sides of, of, of you know, on the U.S. side and on the Israeli side, as I've tried to, to indicate. So that's basically it. Uh, so let me um, summarize. Uh, we need breakthroughs in battery technology, you know, in order to make affordable and safe electric cars. Now, uh, you could argue that the current, elect, uh, current batteries in the Tesla are fairly safe. But to make them safe, they have to go to heroic measures. Uh, they have to put individual sensors on and cutoffs and circuitry and so forth. And that makes the batteries expensive, right? If you could go to an, a much safer and inher inherently safer electrochemistry, uh, uh, that you can make the batteries a lot cheaper. Um, there's uh, uh, certainly a need for flexible and wearable electronics. And of course, uh, we need grid scale energy storage in order to, uh, in order to enable renewable energy, right, at, at a meaningful scale. Uh, so what are the leading strategies? Uh, you, we'd like to get rid of the graphite, enable lithium metal. Um, ideally, we'd like to use the configuration I showed from Professor Pellet's slides, so-called anode-free, where you essentially pull the lithium out of the cathode, uh, and then you cycle it, cycle it back and forth. Certainly want to eliminate cobalt. Uh, we want to continue to develop alternative liquid electrolytes, and especially the ones that contain fluorine. Uh, we'd like to develop solid electrolytes and we want to increase the cycle life of sulfur batteries. So all this and more in the startup nation.